Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for the last NAPB Early Career Working Group webinar we have planned for 2021. My name is Sarah Turner Hissong, and I'll be co hosting today's webinar with Deb Menikos. And for today's discussion, we really wanted to highlight experiences working at companies that provide genotyping, bioinformatic, and biotechnology services for plant breeding. Our panelists include Leanna Knights from Nature Source Improved Plants, Ruth Mays from Computomics and Jesse Hoff from GenCove, and they've all kindly offered to share their experiences navigating careers in research and genomics. We'll aim to leave about 15 minutes towards the end to for audience questions. Um, so please be sure to submit your questions in the Q&A box and to also vote for the questions you'd like to see asked to help us prioritize those in the queue. And I'll be keeping an eye on the questions. So if I see things that are related to current topic, I may also pop in and ask questions. Oh, that's great, Ooh. yeah. And um, yeah, with that, uh, Leanna, Ruth, and Jesse, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, to kick things off, we were hoping you could share a little bit more about yourselves and your career journey. And um, let's start with Leanna, followed by Ruth, and finally, Jesse. Hi, I'm Liana Nice. I am the Director of Breeding Sciences at Nature Source Improved Plants. Um, I've been here with the company for about four years. Um, my background's in plant breeding and genetics. I got a PhD from the University of Minnesota in barley genetics and breeding and did some postdoc work in soybeans. Um, a little bit about Nature Source Improved Plants. We're a computational plant breeding company with um, divisions in Ithaca, New York, a genetics division. And we also have an in vitro division in Tapachula, Mexico. And we have three main kind of business domains that we work in. Our um, Tapachula division, the in vitro division is a large scale in vitro plant propagation facility that does both research and propagation um, for commercial industry uh, for tropical plants and a lot of other uh, types of, of planting materials. Um, here in the genetics division, which I'm associated with, uh, we provide computational breeding technologies to seed and food industry partners. And um, that's what I'm mostly involved in. And then we also have kind of a joint um, capability between our genetics and our in vitro division. And we are running um, a variety of breeding programs for targeting tropical and orphan crops. All right, hello, my name is uh, Ruth Mays. Uh, I head up the, I'm the director for business, global business strategy at Computomics. <clears throat> I've been with the company over three years. Um, my background is I was actually a pharmacist and then I um, did some more qualifications and um, have been in the biotech industry around about 15 years now. I've worked for a variety of different companies. Um, I've worked for BGI and Illumina and also Kyogen. And my background is it predominantly was in uh, human healthcare. And uh, obviously I transitioned into plant genetics uh, a few years ago when I joined Computomics. Computomics was founded in 2012, and we pride ourselves on bringing very new and innovative services to industry. Uh, we offer a multitude of services, um, but one of our main um, services includes um, predictive plant breeding and discovery work, uh, which utilizes uh, unique machine learning capabilities. Great, and I think I'm, I'm last up. I, my name is Jesse Hoff. I uh, did a PhD in the, at the University of Missouri in cattle genomics. Um, uh, and then I uh, switched to the, the plant world working at uh, Benson Hill, a gene editing uh, plant genomic selection and, and breeding company based out of St. Louis, uh, a startup in uh, 2017 and worked there for a few years and then uh, for the last uh, almost two years now been working at uh, Genco which is based in New York though I am a, a remote member of, of the team which I'll be happy to talk about as well in the sort of career guidance forum um, and I'm, I'm based out of Los Angeles currently though I was 
originally in Los Angeles. And Genco is a software company that provides genotyping based on high frequency sequencing, what is commonly known in the plant uh, community as skin sequencing. And so we uh, work with both service providers and end users to uh, initiate projects and provide our software platform that can interpret high throughput sequence data and, and uh, offer high quality genotyping data sets uh, at the cost of genotyping arrays or other legacy genotyping solutions. And we work, uh, I, I manage our agrogenomics endeavors. Um, so that includes a lot of, of, of animal breeding, but also plant breeding as well. Uh, and we, we, we focus on, uh, in, in the plant side, we, we work with uh, really on groups that are setting up genomic selection, often in uh, populations or species where there aren't high quality existing genotyping resources available. So we work with, with plant groups that are either starting their genomic selection program or starting a, a new uh, species program within their group. Um, and we help uh, construct the necessary genetic data sets to, to drive the imputation driven process that we use for, for genotyping and uh, help, help make sure that they have the resources necessary to, to deliver these, these sequencing products. So uh, we work with a lot of interesting groups in, in, in the plant world and uh, very happy to share with you all more about that and about uh, what, what the, the career field looks like. Nice to be here today. Thanks, everyone. Jesse, it looks amazing there. I'm just like admiring your outdoor view. <laughs> it looks really I, pleasant. I am actually, uh, Sarah, you'll appreciate this. I am actually in sunny Madison, Wisconsin today. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. jealous. Okay. Um, yeah, so kind of that that was really great. Thanks so much for providing that, that context of your current roles and what each company is working on. Um, I think probably a lot of people in our group are interested on what types of career paths somebody with a plant breeding background could follow at each of your companies. And um, maybe let's switch up the order and start with uh, Jesse, Liana, and then Ruth. Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Oh yeah, um, could you talk a little bit more about which career paths a plant breeder could potentially follow at your respective companies? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so we're, we're a relatively small team. Um, we're about uh, 14 people now, um, but you know I, I think that uh, so there's there's really there's three areas that, that potentially um, somebody with a plant breeding or genetics background could could be involved in as a company, um, but really two main main ones, and one would be sort of a data scientist um, support role, uh, and. That, that's not what I'm doing in, in my day to day right now, uh, but uh, you know, essentially, that's helping customers uh, develop uh, genotyping data resources uh, and sequencing large plant populations uh, and doing the analysis of that uh, data, uh, and then helping customers with, with pilot projects and, in some cases, doing actual downstream analysis uh, on a more limited basis, uh, as well as developing algorithms for, for uh, general use on our system, uh, as well as potentially you know, plant-specific plant algorithms, which, which are certainly on our, our general purview and roadmap. And I, I think there's a lot of uh, continued need for, for plant-specific, uh, or at least plant-optimized um, systems uh, in, in genotyping and sequencing space. Uh, and so, so that domain knowledge and that experience is, is very helpful. And, you know, we, we work sort of as a third party research support group. And I think what you see in, in a lot of the plant uh, breeding world is that there's a, a limit on, on the availability of, of high quality bioinformatics experience, um, particularly coupled with uh, uh, professional grade software engineering. Um, and so you know, our team, by being able to couple that domain understanding with a high quality software engineering team can really offer a lot to third parties. Uh, and so bringing more you know, uh, project capability to different plant projects is, is something that, that we anticipate and continuing to grow in the future. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a lot that, that well-trained uh, data scientists, bioinformatician 
uh, folks uh, can bring to the table uh, at, at a company like ours. And then there's also sort of the commercial side, uh, which is where I work on, on working with customers, helping them identify what their project needs are and um, understanding what their, their use cases are, which are extremely varied across uh, the plant uh, uh, world. And, and also, you know, the plant world, I think, is, is number one in terms of sort of the diversity of different assays that are used, the diversity of different use cases that are used. And so um, having a deep understanding of that, and having a familiarity with what the industry is using and doing is, is something that uh, uh, you know, high quality experience can, can bring a lot to an organization as ours. Yeah, at NSIP, we have two main divisions in our, our groups within our genetics division. We have a, an R&D group, which is primarily, um, well, it's a, it's a diversity of scientists and software developers, which are really the um, the machinery of our technology. And we also have a breeding group, breeding sciences group, which is mostly plant scientists and plant breeders. And our plant sciences and plant breeders are kind of the, um, the interface between our R&D group and our clients. And our clients are, are breeders typically, or, um, you know, seed companies that want to do breeding in a new way or a different way uh, uh, with more computational backing and or some breeding programs that are really just getting started. So um, the role of um, our plant breeders within our company and our breeding sciences group is to really um, interpret the, the needs of our clients, interact a lot with the R&D group to um, develop and refine our technologies, and then also, you know, pass that um, results and the the really the design of the programs and all of the different kinds of outputs that we provide to our clients. Um, additionally, we do have um, a group of breeders which are on the ground in Mexico doing, um, you know, more traditional field breeding, um, but they're obviously also very closely connected with our breeding sciences group here in Ithaca. Ruth, I think you may be muted still. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think we work in a very similar uh, way. We uh, liaise with breeding consultants so that we can understand the sort of challenges inherent with um, each crop. And we work uh, with breeders to achieve um, his or her breeding goals. The breeding consultants that we, that we um, employ, they help to bridge the gap between the applied breeders' knowledge and the capabilities and understanding um, of using these complex data sets to unlock and understand the genetic potential within the breeding program. So our breeders um, liaise with um, obviously breeders in many different companies um, across sectors. So we sort of work with them in getting the right data sets together, uh, generating um, the robust populations and then doing early generating, generation sort of testing. So we really try to sort of bridge that gap between all of the, the data and obviously the applied. Um, so that's how we utilize breeders within our within computonics. Awesome. Deb, do you want to ask a question? I think the QA box is pretty sparse right now. So maybe you can jump in and oh and ask them wait, first. I haven't seen any. No, no, there's nothing there. I'm oh okay, to, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> encourage I got people it. to I got submit it. questions. <laughs> yeah. People go ahead and submit questions if you have any, but um, another question. So, and I don't know um, if your companies are self-designed uh, uh, as startup or not, but uh, some of you are in, in smaller company or startup companies. And Jesse, you did mention you, you worked in a startup too. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about what it is like to, to join a startup and uh, if you have any experience, maybe contrast with small traditional companies, if you had experience in that as well. Um, tell us a little bit more about that aspect, I guess. And Liana, so what I don't know if it's a computer mix is uh, considered as a startup or if it's a 
a more a bigger and more anchored company um yeah we would be considered i guess still a startup a startup as well okay cool so you can all <laughs> tell us more so i guess we can uh, start by ruth and then liana and jesse if you want to tell us a little bit more about the, the startup experience so off. Yeah, well, Computomics Compu is quite a dynamic company. Uh, we have a, a, a real core team of bioinformaticians and machine learning experts who develop sort of multi-omics um, solutions for a variety of many different biological data sets. These can include anything from transcriptomics, we do metagenomics, causal gene identification for obviously CRISPR, and um, many, many diverse bespoke projects, but of course we also have um, something called our exceed score technology, which is our predictive breeding using uh, machine learning. So we work by pooling skills and resources. We're quite a small dynamic company um, and we work together. We're very much a, a small team, family orientated sort of kind of company. We work very closely together uh, and we sort of pool our resources all of our bioinformaticians and machine learners, they have core spe specialist areas, um, which is quite diverse. Um, and we work to provide our clients with, um, with a real sort of um, solution based. Um, so I guess, I guess we call it actual actionable results. So our, our core aim is to be able to give our clients results that they can really action upon action upon because data is quite complex uh, and I think there does need uh, a lot of education in developing data but developing the right kind of data. We also have uh, a team that is designated for a de designated R&D roadmap for our new and existing services and all employees have the opportunity to be innovative and improve and extend their, their, their skill sets. Yeah, I mean, so working in a small company is definitely different than working in a huge multinational company. I don't think there's any denying that. Um, and I think maybe it also speaks to kind of your career path question that career paths are very different in a small company because there's not this very established hierarchy often or, or you know, it, it's just a little more amorphous maybe when you only have 10 or 15 people in the, in the company or in the division. So um, what, what the, the, the alternate of that though, is that there's a lot more um, kind of perhaps innovation possibilities or interaction, or um, you're able to really influence the company in a different kind of way than you might be able to in a smaller, in a larger company. Um, you know, there, there's kind of the trope of like a big ship is hard to, to move. Um, a small ship can kind of change as it needs. And um, I definitely have experienced that, that aspect of that smaller company culture. Um, but then at the same time, maybe there's not like, as you know, you go from this position to this position to this position, um, because really there's, there's a different, you know, feel to the, the, the group. Um, the other piece about, um, like what it's like to be in a startup. And I think that's something that, you know, if you're considering going into working in this type of environment or smaller companies or companies that are newer, um, there is a, a variety, you know, how do you define what a startup is? I don't know. Is it time? Is it how you get your funding? Um, you know, we've been around for about 15 years and we're, we're, we haven't taken, we're not a big, you know, um, a venture capital type of, of funding source. We have a, you know, a, a business model that's different than that, that it's where um, we're client focused um, and we're, you know, profitable in that space. And we've had somewhat of a slow growth over that past 15 years. Um, so those are the types of things that I certainly thought about and considered when I was looking at um, different career options within space outside of um, kind of the big breeding companies. Um, and I'd encourage, you know, people who are, are looking into these types of careers to really, you know, do your research about, um, about the companies you're looking at, figure out, you know, do, do you mesh with the company vibe? Do you mesh with the, um, the company 
goals and and all of those kind of cultural things um but also do you think that it's a company that's going to be successful and that um you'll be able to make a career in great great comments from from both of my my co-panelists um i i uh I am also well. I've only worked at startups, I guess, since uh, since grad school, um, and two two pretty different kinds of startups. Uh, one, Vincent Hill, a company that was about fifty people when I joined, and about one hundred fifty when I, I left, uh, about two years later. So a pretty rapid pace of growth, and then uh, currently a company that's you know, a lot of which during COVID, but it's been. Uh, uh, on a slower trajectory of growth from, from about 10 or 11 people to 14 or 15 people and uh, continuing uh, along that kind of path now, uh, very different growth stages um, and different scopes and amb ambitions. Uh, startups are great, uh, but require, you know, really doing your, your homework and knowing what, what you're getting into. Um, I think that, you know, at one of the the uh, advantages, as as Juliana mentioned, is that there's a lot of uh, adaptability at startups, and uh, new things can come along that can drive new directions very quickly. Uh, and I think some startups will be more prone than others to just sort of jumping on on different trends as, as they come along, and some will have a more kind of singular focus and mission. So I think it's it's good to understand what your preferences might be uh, and how, how comfortable you would be with uh, business model changes over a, a six month period uh, or, or something of, of that nature. Uh, and really trying to get an understanding. It, it's, it's very important at a startup to, to have when you're coming in uh, a big picture view of what the company's goals are and time frames that they, they might be adjusted on and make sure that you're comfortable with that. Whereas if you're, you're coming into a larger company, I, I think um, you you can have a slightly stronger anticipation that you're broadly coming in for some predefined sets of programs and projects, and there'll be a reasonably long time horizon around that uh, that that will be maintainable and understandable. Um, a great company culture at a startup is is really awesome uh, and can can be a lot of fun and and. Can, can be, I think, very rewarding and create kind of an all hands together kind of mission that, that you know, it's, it's just even at the best large companies, it's, it's harder to extend. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you like wearing different hats, then startups offer a lot of opportunity for, for doing that as well, for sure. So um, more, more so than, than larger companies, but, but larger companies can be flexible too. Uh, and I, I think more, more than anything, and any any job, really understanding the people that you're going to be working with and getting a sense of how well you can get along, how well they get along uh, at, at startups, at smaller companies, um, negative personal interactions can, can be more of a drain and are harder to work around than at larger organizations where there's more uh, regimented approaches to dealing with those things. And, Just some some personal observations and, and observations from friends and that sort of thing in the startup world. So. Great. Yeah, I think you've all um, sort of alluded to uh, this next question in your your responses to that last question. Um, but could you talk a little bit more about any unique aspects of your current role or your respective companies that are especially motivating or that you find really um, fun compared to re previous roles that you've held? I'll jump in. So I think one of our, um, one of the things that I really like about my position is that I get to be involved in a lot of different projects uh, and very different kinds of projects. So um, the thing that's exciting about that is that, you know, we have new things coming in and we have, um, we get that kind of excitement of a new project, a new uh, challenge to tackle. And then also, um, I guess the other big piece for me is that we, um, 
we get to kind of use that shared understanding across all those different projects to inform each piece. And then also, but each piece has its own unique aspects that we kind of get to play within. And, um, and we get to interact with a lot of different people. And we get to also have those um, kind of personal connections. And um, what I really enjoy is working with breeders and seeing kind of the excitement that they bring to the table when, um, when these technologies are working well, when they're, um, you know, producing actual products that are um, successful and, um, and different from what they've been doing. And that's really where I find um, my, my biggest kind of excitement and motivation within our company. Let's feel free to go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think my response is very similar to Leanne's really. I find it really rewarding when you actually get to um, work with different clients who are mainly uh, breeders uh, and you really sort of see that um, you, you start to work with them, you start to implement the technology very slowly and then suddenly you see in this genetic gain each cycle and the, you know, the, the breeders get very excited and what I find very rewarding is when you've worked with a, a prospective breeder for a few years, a few cycles, and then you actually get to see um, some of the predictions that your technology has, as you know, some, some of these predictions from your technology actually start to be commercialized. And I think that's extremely rewarding and very exciting. I really, I really like um, working uh, with people and um, uh, I very much enjoy uh, working with my team and, you know, we strive to really help breeders to, to understand all of the different challenges that are inherent within their breeding programs and really respond to, to these challenges and, and work with them very closely to find solutions. Also, the, the technology that we deploy at Computomics opens up the ability to do a vast array of discovery work as well, which is extremely diverse and also very exciting. So I, I find my, my role very, very fulfilling. Um, and as both of the other panelists said, you know, you do wear many hats uh, when you work for a startup, which keeps the role very diverse. And uh, yeah, every day is, is a new, exciting day. Yeah, and I, I'll add it, it. I think it's very clear that kind of in the, the segments and the types of companies that we're at, that there's uh, a lot of sort of external facing roles. And consistently, that's, that's kind of a exciting thing to be able to do to work with other groups. I'm back here on my first post-COVID uh, work trip and getting to, you know, be with, with clients for a day and see how how programs are going for them and, and help them get set up running things is is, is super rewarding. Um, it's uh, a lot, particularly with sort of sharing new technologies. Um, there's a lot of education and communication. Uh, and you know, it's it's always important to to remember that, that even very technically astute people in, in different roles are always going to sort of have less of an understanding of what you're doing than, than, than you do. And so, you know, bridging that gap is, is really crucial and important and, and can be very rewarding. And especially when you're working in a field with people who are very curious about learning new things. So taking that time and, and effort to, to be an effective communicator is 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 a big big part of the role. Um, and it's, it's great for me currently working at, at, a, at a company that's it's very focused on a, a pretty uh, core set of competencies. Um, and that, uh, that really, you know, they, those can have a, a broad range of, of impacts, but uh, that, that creates kind of a good uh, unified focus for, for, for our, our activities. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think I think those are, and as the other panelists have said, a good summary of the things that are rewarding about these kinds of roles and these kinds of companies or organizations. Yeah, not getting to travel to visit clients has been a, a rough year for for me. I, I miss that, you know, 
one-on-one -on -one human inter interaction and actually going and seeing seeing things in the field. Yeah, I completely agree with that one. It has been quite challenging not being able to go out and see your clients and be out in the field with them. Soon, soon. <laughs> Uh, we have a few questions uh, from attendees, and actually, you hinted at one of them, but there is another one that's linked. So, uh, somebody, Natalie, asked if, uh, especially for Ruth and uh, Liana, if uh, your company also had uh, bioinformatics and that data scientist role, uh, such as uh, Jesse had described. Uh, and I, my guess is that yes, you guys do. And the second question um, is to give an example of the kind of projects uh, you do when you're talking about those projects you do with the different breeders um, and what are the objectives, what kind of skills you're using to, to do those projects. And I'll let you guys jump in in any order you want. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Ruth. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I don't know how much uh, time we have to go into to great detail, but of course we, we are a bioinformatic um, um, company. As I said, we focus mainly on deploying machine learning technology for most of our um, applications, but we do also do very much core bioinformatic uh, analysis as well. Our projects are very, very diverse. And as I alluded to earlier, we also work on very bespoke projects. This could be, you know, anything from um, really complex annotations right through to looking at, um, you know, um, the RNA expression data um, right through to, um, as I say, predictive reading. It, it, it's extremely diverse, the, the sort of uh, projects we, we work on. And um, as I also mentioned, we also have a metagenomics uh, suite of tools as well. So we sort of try to um, look at all of uh, these different um, aspects and, and try to uh, help our clients on uh, many different levels. Um, I guess the the, my favorite uh, service that we offer is our Exceed Score uh, technology, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, does utilize um, machine learning technology, which is extremely unique uh, simply because it looks at um, each marker and combinations of markers, uh, which actually can influence the phenotype. It also lends itself very well to incorporating very complex data sets, so digital data sets, which can be anything from soil analysis right through to wind speed, temperature, um, all of these different aspects um, can be, this data can be included uh, and utilized very effectively, very effectively using um, machine learning, which sort of gives you a G by E um, effect, really. Um, yeah, I guess that's, I could go on for, for, for ages, so I think I'll stop there and, and, and pass over to, to the others. Yeah, so our company really started more project-based where we had a few key technologies that we um, worked with clients. So for example, um, a lot of our original technologies were in the, the realm of diversity and increasing diversity within breeding programs and working with more diverse um, germplasm. And it would kind of be projects that were surrounding that. How do we you know, bring in these technologies to make um, like a diversity integration process much more effective and, and run that process with our clients. Um, we've really expanded because over the past, you know, 15 years, we've, you know, needed new tools and clients have come to us with new ideas and things that they wanted to accomplish. And um, we've developed out many more um, predictive technologies and uh, other computational solutions for uh, for these problems that are really key to the breeding program. And um, our projects now are much more holistic in the sense that we have longer term relationships, some 10 year you know, relationships with, um, with our clients where we're really um, implementing our technologies on a large scale across their breeding program. And so that 
takes, you know, all those different pieces that you need to have computational support. And we're, um, we're bringing in our, um, you know, developed pieces and, and, and kind of weaving them all together to make um, effective uh, breeding programs that really utilize um, all that data that can come out of a breeding program and um, help to make decisions. And I, I think um, one of the really key things that I think about a lot is how do you make decisions within breeding programs? And um, that's really where we're uh, working. We're trying to say, what are, what are the big problems? What do breeders have to figure out how to make selections or, or make um, decisions within their program? And how can we uh, alleviate that or, or make it more effective for them? Um, and of course, we have a we have a wide variety of different types of backgrounds within our R and D group. So we have people who have skills in bioinformatics, but we also have um, you know computer scientists and um, operations researchers and um, it's, it's statisticians. You know, it's 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 really um, I think one of the things I really love about our company is that we have all these different backgrounds, and that um, kind of facilitates a lot of of questioning and a lot of interaction that um, you don't get if you're just sitting in a room with a bunch of breeders, um, because you have to kind of make that translation between all of those different backgrounds. And I think that um, that ability provides kind of a, a nice uh, melting pot of um, ideas. Great. Um... So yeah, I, I know the question was directed to the other people. It's about other uh, jobs. No, I, actually, the second, the second part of the question was totally uh, for about projects. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just to, to, to comment on that, the, the first part of the question about bioinformatics, I I, I, uh, I would encourage folks who are looking for for jobs in that area to go to our, our website g e n c o v e dot com, uh, and there's a careers link at, at the bottom. So I can shamelessly plug that. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I would say projects that, that I work on that are kind of typical of uh, you. You're getting out a little bit, Jesse. I think your connection is a little spotty. You've been catching out a little bit. It was difficult to understand what you were saying. And I guess your image looks a little smoother now. Uh, and oh, now sorry. we can't hear you. Oh, can, here we go. can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it okay. seemed to be smoother. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, did you get the part about the, the website? Should I do I need to say that again? I can post the link too. Yeah, we got the website. Okay. It's yeah. in so, the chat so, for anyone interested. Thank you. For that. Um, it, uh, the, the products that we typically work on involve, say, setting up a our technology at low pass sequencing for a new species. So we start with identifying whether or not there's an appropriate reference genome available, actually helping the client develop one of those, um, and then sequencing core material in their population, so identifying the appropriate strategy for that, uh, whether it's sort of a mapping population where we only need to capture some few parents or a broader diversity panel, um, and then running tests and implementations of, of the data, perhaps with an outside data type to make sure that they're getting high quality and accuracy for, for the low pass sequencing that we develop and, and then figuring out a, a solution for, for, for scaling that, that data development for them, whether that's setting up sequencing in-house for them or uh, working with a local service provider somewhere geographically reasonable for them uh, to, to deliver their data. So it's, it's a lot of client interaction. It's a lot of data quality management understanding the specifics of their program. And uh, yeah, that, that's kind of typical. Awesome. So uh, 
Dev, I may jump in and ask another one from the Q&A if that's okay. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of related. Um, so I think probably a lot of folks are in, in the audience are interested in potential internship opportunities for master's and PhD level students. Um, could you talk a little bit about what opportunities might exist at um, each of your companies and um, how folks can apply for those? And yeah, feel free to jump in. I can give an order, but it seems like it's working okay. So. <laughs> Well, shall I start on this one? So yeah, we're very passionate about um, uh, helping uh, students uh, and uh, we do actually, um, uh, yeah, we do take uh, interns in every year, several actually. Um, so if if you are interested in, um, yeah, interested in, in joining a, a very innovative dynamic company like Computomics, then please reach out to me directly and um, I can pass on to your, your email details um, to the, the relevant um, human resources department. We haven't had interns, um, but I think it's something that we're kind of ongoing discussions about how it would work within our company. Um, so if, you know, if it is something of interest to people, definitely reach out. Um, I'd say one of, you know, one of the things about a smaller company, at least ours, um, is that we don't hire a ton of, you know, all the time. <laughs> we, we don't always have open positions. So um, just keeping, keeping an eye on it. And when things come up that um, we try to, you know, find good people for. So we do currently have an opening that we're working on filling and um, I put it in the chat. Um, but yeah, if, if we're, we're still figuring out the internship thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so I think I'm going to kind of, um, well, yeah, I think there's been a lot of discussion around like different skills that are required to be successful um, at, at each company. Um, so I picked up on like communication, bioinformatics, domain and breeding expertise, and, and data science. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about um, which skills were critical for you to be successful in your current position and also um, any recommendations you have for people preparing to enter the job market and things they should be thinking about as they get in that mindset. Yeah, I'll add to that list, um, just organization and knowing how to get stuff done. I mean, it's, you know, it's such a basic thing, but it's so essential to, um, especially a small company when you have a very small workforce that, you know, and a lot of things going on. Um, definitely interacting with people and working well in teams. And then I'd also add um, critical thinking and kind of continuing to be open to learning. The, uh, and, and I'd say it's, you know, it's, a little wrote, they're all very kind of general things. Um, but I do think those are some of the key aspects. Um, so when, you know, of course, there is a lot of specific knowledge and a specific um, expertise that people bring into our company, uh, a lot of times we're looking for those more general pieces. And then the specific knowledge really is, um, it's kind of icing. And sometimes it's, um, it's, yeah, that's like we're trying to fill a specific niche that kind of complements the other specific knowledge within the group or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, like really interviewing your interviewers and um, showing interest in, and being confident in the skills that you bring to the table. Those would be my biggest um, recommendations for people who are, are interviewing. I'm not sure how relevant um my response is because uh, obviously my background isn't uh, really scientific because I, I head up the, um, the the business division for Computomics. But I think uh, from my experience working for very large um, multinational organizations and also smaller companies, I think one of the um, most critical requirements when you're a manager is having the right leadership skills. So understanding the challenges of the team and working with them to find solutions to run the, a successful business. I think it's important to know each member of your team and to um, listen to them, 
how I, I always really like brainstorming sessions because you usually get some really great ideas from these kinds of sessions. And I think it, it, it allows the team to feel really valued and listened to. I also think when you, when you think about embarking on working in a startup, you really have to come in with a great optimistic attitude because it is hard working in a startup company is very, diff very, very difficult because, especially from a business uh, perspective, because you are always looking at the strategy, looking at how you are customer facing, how you deploy the strategy. And obviously the aim is to transition to a, a mid-range large company where you obviously capitalize on all your resources uh, and grow. Uh, and obviously the key to success to that is to ensure that you have happy clients. And I think, you know, for anybody who is about to embark on a, on a new career, the most important aspect, I think, and I've always said to my, my daughter, is to find something that you enjoy. Because when you really enjoy what you do, you naturally excel. So I think that's really important for any candidate that's about to go out and get themselves a job. So um, I, I will I will say first and foremost, I, I recommend a strong Wi-Fi connection, uh, particularly in this uh, Zoom era. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, having having worked both on the R and D side and and on the commercial side, uh, communication skills uh, and inter including you know interviewing people coming from from academia to to startups uh, really crucial to be able to um, have some understanding of what what the commercial focus of the organization is and uh, really be able to kind of tune down a little that that um, that academic uh, uh, broad inquiry you know not necessarily sort of uh, completely throttle your, your sense of uh, creativity or passion, but but be able to show a, a sort of more commercial focus um, and uh, a dedication to, to a smaller set of, of projects that you really have to complete in a, in a timely fashion is, is crucial. Um, and yeah, uh, show a, a willingness to, to, to adapt to things, um, to, to potentially take on different kinds of, of roles um, and to work with, with groups and, and different people is that's really extremely crucial at, at any organization. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, it's also, I would say, pretty clear that uh, having a strong computational skill set is a great, uh, great asset in, in the current environment. Um, don't be, if you're, if you're early in your academic career, I, I would say don't be shy about trying to develop those skills. Uh, all kinds of people have, have managed to do it. And uh, most universities have good resources available and good, good other collaborators available and just keep, keep pushing, you'll, you'll get there. Um, and yeah, um, uh, also wanted to say on, on the internship question earlier, unfortunately we, we do not uh, have internships at, the, at this time. Um, a little bit small of an organization to do that, but uh, potentially something that we can explore in the future. Well, thank you. So we have 10 minutes left. Um, and I have, I don't know, maybe some philosophical question. Uh, what do you view as the most exciting new breakthrough in plant breeding that's sort of either happening or that's going to happen in the next decade? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to say not gene editing. So I think there will be less gene editing in the next ten years than people currently think. Um, I think that, uh, and, and maybe I'm speaking to the home crowd here, but uh, I think that there's going to be uh, a lot more expansion of basics of of both genetics and genomic selection to a broader range array of crops and crop types. Um, a continued emphasis on being able to deploy those kinds of tools in, in different environments. Uh, there's still a very long adoption curve of those technologies across the globe and a tremendous amount of value to be captured by, by succeeding in, in doing so. And uh, I think that's, that's the big, uh, big focus for, for industry rather than uh, 
if I can editorialize, continuing to chase uh, magic beans. So, um, yeah. I very much agree with Jesse's response. I think um, a lot of it is going to be um, in that predictive technology realm and how, how it gets ap applied to a lot more um, crops and projects and um, that value that has is still on the table. Yeah, I think I'm naturally going to say that machine learning is is a huge new breakthrough um, because machine learning can considerably improve the prediction accuracy for very complex polygenic traits such as yield or oil content. In contrast to classic classical statistical models, which uses a kinship matrix, which identifies the relatedness of each line, machine learning technology models the influence of each individual marker and marker combinations, which, as I mentioned previously, affect the phenotype. This means that machine learning can model non-additive effects, such as dominance and epistasis. It also provides a better understanding of general combinability and can also identify specific combinability. Um, as well as also, as I mentioned previously, integrating very heterogeneous data sets. I really do believe that machine learning um, applied to biological data sets is um, a real breakthrough for predictive reading and um, uh, a really uh, disruptive uh, technology within this field. Yeah, so maybe with the final 10 minutes, I also totally agree with all of these answers. <laughs> Super interesting to hear different perspectives that's, on that. That's the official perspective of Bayer Crop Sciences? Is that? Uh, yeah. I cannot speak, no, oh, I, right. as a scientist, not as an employee of Bayer. I'll just but, say that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, maybe with the last, I guess, eight minutes, let's, um, we have a couple of specific questions for each panelist. And so maybe we can jump into those. So I'll start with um, Leanna and ask, what are the biggest challenges across working, um, biggest challenges working with such a wide range of ploides and biological systems at nature source improved plants? Um, just making sure you get all those intricacies. Um, you know, there is so much similarity among, um, you know, breeding for different crops, but there are so many little specific pieces that make things different. And making sure you don't miss all of those pieces when you're starting to integrate the technologies. Um, and it does, um, I think, I think that's part of what's so fun about it, though, is like, um, you have lots of different puzzles, they all have some similarities, but you have to kind of um, assemble them in different ways to, to get to your outcome. Yeah, um, Yeah. so I'll jump to Ruth. Um, are there unexpected ways in which your scientific background, which is a little, a little different from where a lot of us are coming from in the plant breeding um, space, um, informs business and commercial strategies at Computomic. Sure. Well, as I mentioned previously, I've worked across sectors within the biotech industry and um, and have a lot of experience in genetic human healthcare uh, and, and obviously more, most recently plant genetics as well. I think it's really imperative to uh, understand how the technology works, um, understand how it can be utilized across business sectors um, and to, to really understand your, your scientific client base and what their needs are and obviously facilitate in using their, that, that their needs to facilitate a strong commercial strategy. Having said that, yes, I do have a scientific background, but I'm sure if you spoke to my CEO, he'd say uh, he employed me for my business acumen more than my scientific background, for sure. Right, and Jesse, our um, question for you was related to how you view um, the sequencing and prediction services offered by GenCove interacting with breeders in both the public and private sectors. Yeah, great question. Um, I think that uh, really there's there's two major um, uh, advantages that, that we have for, for the plant breeding space. And one is, is the, the density of data. Um, 
And I think there's there's a lot of folks who, who are ambitious in their goals of, of wanting to have a really dense representation of, of markers in their populations. And then and the other really um, is flexibility, which comes both from a deployment standpoint of uh, really having a molecular assay that's pretty uh, pretty is, is, is identical regardless of the, the the input material. So we're not sort of designing a, a, a probe set or a panel set, um, and that allows you know a, a, a production lab to to have a lot of volume efficiencies uh, for for any uh, uh, crop system. Um, or, or animal system and, and run all, all the things through through one workflow. Um, but also the, that flexibility comes in terms of uh, the data sets that, that we generate uh, are much easier to harmonize than data sets that you might generate from different types of, uh, of assays. So, uh, you know, your, if you use skin sequencing with us in your different populations, uh, you will have a much easier time unifying and harmonizing all of your, your downstream genotype data sets. Uh, and we, we can always make improvements to our representation of different subpopulations uh, bioinformatically, uh, but we don't sort of get you stuck in a corner of having some probe sets that have wildly different performances across different subpopulations or different restriction enzyme performances and that sort of thing. Um, and so so there's, there's a Lot more ease of use, and, and I, I would add as well that that our, our software capabilities um, and our software system are, uh, I think we're, we're quite proud of how easy they are to use, which is is crucial in data, dealing with data of that scale. So, um, for academic users, for for research users, and for public and, and private breeding segments, it, it makes it easy to continue to incorporate new types of germplasm, as as the other folks on the call have, have emphasized the importance of. Well, I can say from my perspective, this has been a super interesting discussion. It's been really fun to learn about um, all three companies and, and a little bit more about your experiences. Um, I wanted to ask if it's okay. Um, we're happy to share websites for career opportunities and also contact information if you're comfortable with that, um, which we can share um, on the YouTube channel. And then um, wanted to put a plug into um, the audience. If you have ideas for next year's webinar series, please let us know. Um, we'll be looking for ideas soon to start planning next year's events. Um, and yeah, thanks so much, Ruth, Leanna, and Jesse. This was, was really cool. Um, Deb, any other closing comments before we uh, end, end the last webinar of 2021? I think you covered it all, so. Thank you everyone for, for showing up and uh, yeah, hope you, you enjoyed everything we learned. And yeah, we'll have some more next year. So don't hesitate to give us idea of people you want to hear from or companies and yeah. Awesome. Thanks for inviting us, Deb and Sarah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. This was really enjoyable panel. And, and please uh, reach out via email or, or LinkedIn as, as Sarah yep. suggested. Good yeah, luck, I everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.